Kaiju, giant monsters, atomic dinosaurs, giant monkeys, alien horrors, and mechanical machinations made by mankind. This is a genre that is near and dear to my heart and to many others. Many of us love these movies for a whole host of reasons. One, because giant monster fights are just absolutely awesome. Again, giant atomic dinosaur suplexing a three-headed space dragon through skyscrapers is absolutely epic to watch. Same with a giant atomic dinosaur fighting a giant monkey with a battle axe. Again, you don't beat the spectacle, it's great. But what separates these movies from something like Michael Bay's Transformers movies, which as much as I love them, they're really just mindless action. These movies are a lot more like Pacific Rim. They stick with you because it's not just mindless action that five minutes after the movie ends, you just forget about everything else. It's like, oh, that was a really cool effect. They stick with you. The characters stick with you. It gives you more reason to go back, rewatch, and re-experience everything. And with Godzilla Kong the New Empire coming out soon, and the revival of the kaiju genre seeming to be in full swing, I felt it was time that I made sort of a personal retrospective on kaiju and really going over why the genre of kaiju movies is such an important thing. So this is going to be sort of a half discussion video about kaiju movies, and half personal retrospective. These are movies that are about monsters, but they're not about monsters in the same way movies like Jaws or Alien is, where in Jaws, as good of a movie as it is, it's just a shark. It does shark things, and even then it really doesn't act like a normal shark does. It's a monster to be the sake of a monster. Or the Xenomorph from Aliens, which there's a lot of complex themes and motifs behind it, but as time's gone on, it's lost a lot of its fear. The overexposure of it has kind of diminished its horrorness, the terror it used to inspire in people. We don't watch Godzilla to see him simply curb stomp the monster of the week. We love watching it, but we watch them because of the character of Godzilla, because of the character of Kong. Some that elevates the action from pure mindless noise to much the same reason why people are fans of characters like Goku from Dragon Ball. There's a meaning behind that. There is something that we, as viewers, are attached to. It's a series that can get us to go from absolute horror, that humanity is the real monster, to cheering in joy when Godzilla, again, curb stomps the monster of the week, to, at least personally for me, it is one of the few series to actually get me to cry. Godzilla's death and Godzilla vs. Desotroya is one of only three times I've cried when it comes to a fictional character's death. The other two being the Tenth Doctor in Doctor Who dying, love David Tennant, and when Ripley died in Avatar. I don't care that isn't her name. She's Ripley. I grew up watching the Alien movies. Every character played by Sigourney Weaver is Ripley to me. I didn't really cry when Iron Man died in Infinity War because I thought it was well done and it made sense. It's about how invested I was in the MCU at the time, having watched for over a decade at that point. But I still find watching Godzilla vs. Desotroya hard to watch even to this day because it isn't a character going down in a blaze of glory, fighting in one final last stand. It is a slow, drawn-out, saddening death because Godzilla is quite literally melting down. His own power and his defeat of Space Godzilla in the previous movie where he absorbed the energy from the crystals is sending him into nuclear meltdown. And that Godzilla needs to both be destroyed by the ultra-low temperature weaponry systems that they're using because if not, he's going to destroy the whole world. But Godzilla's death is inevitable in that entire movie. Even in the story themselves, the characters are saddened by this. Even those who oppose Godzilla show sorrow at his passing. And then the credits go with a collage of moments from the previous movies. It was something that was meant to be a final send-off to Godzilla, and I'm beyond happy that wasn't the case, that we do have more of these movies, that it continued on, and even to this day, we still have new kaiju films starring Godzilla. But there's no other movie, no other piece of fiction that has ever been able to get me to feel the same way that the end of Godzilla vs. Destroya got me. Even just talking about it now, I'm getting a bit joked up. I'd love to hear what your story is with, with Godzilla. Kong, Pacific Rim, Ultraman, any of these kaiju series. I'd love to hear what your guys' experiences were with them. But there's a pure joy that seeing a 350-foot fire-breathing atomic dinosaur, I know Godzilla's not actually a dinosaur, I just 
again, simplification, that nothing else can capture, and that's one of the reasons why this series has a universal appeal, something that even today we still see over and over and over again. Movies like Godzilla Minus One have succeeded when other movies have failed in the modern day, Godzilla vs. Kong being the most pirated movie of 2021, being the single best performing opening movie on HBO Max since HBO Max launched. In the first two weeks, nearly 5 million houses watched it. And that is a movie that released both on streaming services and in theaters at the same time. Meanwhile, other movies were being absolutely gutted by the pandemic gripping the world. Word of mouth alone kept people going to the theaters to see these movies, kept people going online to watch them. Because there are some movies that just need a big screen experience. It also was one of the best, if not the best, performing movie of the entire pandemic. Especially when it came to the opening week and opening weekend, that's the most important part of it. These are movies that get people to come out and watch in ways that other movies like Transformers or superhero movies, when it comes to action movies, just can't. And they're ones that can inspire us, the viewers, in ways others aren't as able to. When I was younger, my role model wasn't Goku or Superman or Captain America like I know a lot of others were. Mine, as strange as it was, was Godzilla. Because no one got in Godzilla's way. No one could stop Godzilla. When he wanted to do something, he would go and do it, no matter who opposed him. And I strive to be like that. Whenever I feel down, even today, whenever I thought about giving up, I always thought, what would Godzilla do? And that's a mindset to this day I still keep. But back to these movies and why they're so important. The kaiju in these movies, especially the ones more modernly, they're not just mindless. They're not just animals. They're characters that have a legitimate intelligence behind them. Something that the MonsterVerse has done justice to. It's both reinvented and updated the characters while still remaining faithful. Kong's compassion and protecting us over humanity, his ability to actually talk with humans through sign language. These very human qualities like using tools in a fight, recognizing weaknesses he has compared to Godzilla or even the Skull Devil, using a boat propeller on a chain to basically as an almost like a lasso, or, a, or using the boat's propeller as a blade to the Godzilla Spike Axe, which is implied to be created by previous members of Kong's species, showing this is not just an anomaly of Kong. There is this humanity in him that makes him relatable. He's the hero, if you will, of the MonsterVerse. He's not just a big monkey with a fixation on a woman like he pretty much used to be. The, especially the start of Godzilla vs. Kong, where it shows him waking up the whole morning routine, him just being annoyed by the light of the fake sun, showering underneath a waterfall, stretching and scratching himself as he's going walking around. That's stuff that immediately any of us find, and yeah, that's that's how we are in the morning. And then just chucking the tree into the dome. He, he, he was completely aware he was inside of the dome the whole time. It just... He took some time to wake up. And then the little bits of communication with the little girl. She taught him sign language. The two of them can speak. And later on in the movie, when he was looking for her, he made sure she wasn't inside the little flying craft thing when the person was shooting at him before he just crushed the thing. He's wrathful, he's not just benevolent, but he displays protectiveness to individuals he cares about. Godzilla, on the other hand, is the true neutral. He is the status quo. While you say, while well, Kong is the hero of the story, Godzilla is the protagonist. It is his story. But he is the truest of neutrals. I like that he doesn't care about humanity. We are truly nothing to him. Until we start messing with him and we start trying to build a giant robot to dethrone him, we're nothing. And then he promptly shows us why he's the boss. It takes a lot to get me to genuinely fear a character I have loved ever since I was a small youngling. He's territorial, but he's not unintelligent. He knows Kong can't swim, so when Kong is brought on the boats over the water, what does he try to do? He just tries to straight up drown the monkey. Even though he beat Kong the first time, he still wanted to rematch because he wanted to put Kong down because he knew Kong was a threat, or at least could potentially be a threat. But Godzilla is not above respect. He was impressed by Kong's continued defiance and unwillingness to give up, even after Godzilla had beaten him. 
that measure of respect is shown when Godzilla does actually kill Kong in the movie. The pod is what defibrillates Kong and basically brings him back to life when Godzilla kills him in the third fight. But he was the one that actually ended the rivalry on equal terms. The two of them stared each other down, Kong was ready to fight Grip in the battle axe, but Godzilla just walked past, showing, even though I've beaten you, I respect you. You are someone who is an ally, because they defeated Mechagodzilla together. They are, in a sense, battle brothers now. Maybe not friends, but begrudging allies. Maybe not even begrudging anymore. Whereas he does have a connection with Mothra, who is a true ally with no strings attached. And all of that characterization was just inside of one movie. Mothra, on the other hand, even though she has stayed faithful to her characterization throughout the years, that consistency is something that is kept with some new layers of additions. She is loyal specifically to Godzilla, recognizing him as the true master of Earth because her aims are the protection of the whole of Earth, recognizing Godzilla has Earth's best interests in mind. Whereas Ghidorah is an outside threat that needs to be dealt with. When all the other Titans go to obey Ghidorah, she's the one that defies him. She instantly goes to help Godzilla, or at least to seek them out, and leads the humans to Godzilla after they kind of screwed up with the oxygen destroyer. She is literally hovering over Castle Bravo to get their attention in a basic display of, you made this problem, you're going to unmake this, and you're going to fix Godzilla. Leading them to Godzilla's resting place where they can detonate a nuke to repower him up, and then ultimately sacrificing herself to save Godzilla. She faced Ghidorah herself, knowing she was outmatched, just to buy Godzilla a little bit of time. That is a self-sacrifice. And again, even when she is fighting humans, she fights non-lethally, webbing them up or tossing them into a giant spider web rather than just simply biting them and moving on. There is benevolence, but not simple, but not simple pacifism. She only fights when provoked or when it is needed. Ghidorah, on the other hand, yeah, Ghidorah's not as much of a personality as the others. He really just goes around to love and to destroy for the sake of being destroying. But even then, they did add depth to his character. The three heads each having different personalities, like Kevin. We love Kevin. Even though beforehand Godzilla and Ghidorah were often regarded as nemeses or rivals, there was never really a personal vested rivalry between them in story. It was more an outside universe rivalry. In much the same way that people view Pikachu as a rival with Raichu, it, it was something that exists outside of context, not as much in universe. But this movie, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, made that rivalry something in-universe, where Ghidorah recognizes Godzilla is the only kaiju that can stand up against him, and so hyperfixates on destroying any possible threat to challenge his authority. This is shown when he doesn't regard the orca as a problem, and then, later on in the movie, when the orca starts going off, he immediately goes to destroy it, knowing this thing can call the other titans, this is a problem, I need to get rid of it. But that hyperfixation, that almost OCD level of paranoia that he shows. Before, he was just a walking tank of destruction, going through, wiping out everything in his path without a second thought. Now, there's a cruelty. There's a genuine malice Ghidorah displays. He enjoys absolutely over-game-ending humans. He uses the gravity beams when it's completely excessive. Because it's sadistic. It's malicious. It craves the terror and destruction it brings. It's got an ego that makes the human ego look like a monk. Whereas before, Ghidorah was just a planet-hopping world killer for funsies, or a pawn to be used by aliens. And that characterization is what we come to see. We don't just want to watch mindless noise. It's one of the reasons why these movies, and especially the earlier Godzilla movies, have left such a big impression on me. I didn't want to just consume a kaiju-related content. It takes a lot for the character evolution we've seen with things like Godzilla and Kong. Over the past 70 years, Godzilla's gone from a symbol of nuclear destruction into, as overly sarcastic podcasts put it, a grumpy Captain Planet. From movies that are nuclear allegories to movies where a 350-foot atomic dinosaur is suplexing a three-headed space dragon through a skyscraper. Godzilla's got range, and it doesn't feel out of place. 
But the series are never afraid to pull Godzilla back to his roots. Dr. Sarazawa brings it up explicitly in the 2014 movie, much more directly was addressed in King of the Monsters, and especially with Shin Gojira, it was used in many ways in the same breath as the original movie. It was a criticism in response to the horrible handling of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. While Godzilla Minus One is, in a lot of ways, a not direct retelling of the original movie, but rather a returning back to the core identity of what Godzilla is and making a new story that combines the modern incarnation of Godzilla movies as movies both for entertainment as well as movies that show these are not just dumb monster movies. These are not just campy movies for younglings that show giant dinosaurs fighting each other. These are movies that have a message, have a reason to exist beyond spectacle. And people still turn out in droves for them. That core identity has never been lost. And that core identity is why we love these characters. And all of that from an initial movie where all the feelings we feel about these movies today isn't the point. The original is psychological horror. And while I think the original Godzilla movie is a far better movie than Minus One, at least for the purpose of what it was supposed to be, I do appreciate Minus One. I prefer the original's psychological horror. You're meant to be terrified. You're meant to feel powerless. Whereas Minus One is a pushing back against that destruction that we can overcome the mistakes we've made in the past. And going even so far into other movies, Pacific Rim, made by the wonderful Guillermo del Toro, someone who truly understands monsters. It's not just a movie about people in giant mech robots punching the stuff in out of alien monsters. It's humanity coming together to face a threat greater than just one of us. Some that, on our own, we can't stand a chance against, but united, we are strong. For all the terror, for all the destruction these beasts represent, there is a hopefulness that each of them have. That hopefulness, that inspiration is something that has personally affected me. Godzilla is, as mentioned before, both a role model I've looked up to ever since I was younger. But I think now we should move on to something a bit more about the movies themselves, how they're made, the underlying mentalities of what makes them work. It's that the creators fully embrace how absurd things are. They don't care about realism or not being silly. Things like Godzilla Final Wars going out of its way to make several pot shots at the 1998 American Godzilla. Even as someone who both likes the original 1998 Godzilla movie and the follow-up animated series, I still get a kick out of that. When Godzilla, Godzilla Mothra, King Ghidorah, Giant Mars, All Out Attack also makes a jab at it and then they double down on it with Final Wars, I still lose it in laughter at that. You don't see movies doing that anymore. To stuff like Godzilla vs. Kong, where they reference Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon 2, with Kong resetting his dislocated shoulder, something that when I saw that in the theaters with my dad, both of us instantly understood the reference, something my brother hadn't seen because he doesn't watch Lethal Weapon. But I love that reference. To even referencing the infamous scene of Kong shoving a tree down Godzilla's throat, being referenced by the handle of the axe, which, as my cousins call it, Stormbreaker. It's to the scene of the helicopters carrying Kong. These movies, and just not explaining, how did they get Kong in the net anyway? You know, they're not afraid to reference, to make absurd moments of cinema a reality for the sake of both pure spectacle, but also very honorable homages. It's not just warping the entire story to be a carbon copy of what came before, but they take those ideas and they update them. They make them their own. Things like the Oxygen Destroyer and Godzilla, King of the Monsters. It's not just, oh, we're going to use the Oxygen Destroyer and it does the same thing. No, it completely fails. It ends up almost killing Godzilla and does nothing to Ghidorah. It's plot relevant, but also it's a very clever twist on the original idea, which was as a weapon to kill Godzilla, but ultimately fails when Godzilla is the savior and it doesn't kill the one monster they want to kill it. Because Godzilla was actually going to win that fight against Ghidorah. If it wasn't for humanity intervening, Godzilla would have actually beaten him. Humanity kind of really dropped the ball on that one. But writing like that is what we need in movies more. References to the past that honors the original ideas, but brings them into the modern day in a way that isn't just a simple carbon copy. But as much as these movies are about the monsters, there are the human characters. I know most of us don't really care as much for human characters in monster movies, but 
Both, we do need them as it gives a perspective to see the monsters through, but also to see ourselves in the stories. When I was writing, and I still am writing, my own monster stories, I have one major philosophy when it comes to making a character. You make the characters respect and appreciate the monsters. The monsters always come first. Their presence needs to be felt even when they are not in the scene. There is that respect, there is that fear, and there is the appreciation, which they have nailed in a lot of characters in the Monsterverse. This is best epitomized by Ishiro Serizawa, because as a character, he's a lot like us fans. He has a respect for the monsters, and in some cases a love specifically for Godzilla and what Godzilla stands for. To quote Gojipedia, according to Ken Watanabe, he was originally supposed to name drop the monster as Godzilla. However, seeing as both him and his character were Japanese, he insisted on using the original name Gojira was more appropriate. Like, massive respect to that, because that shows an in-universe appreciation for the monster, and an out-of-universe appreciation on the part of the creator, which is what you need. That passion for doing justice to the characters and the series. Something even Joe Brody, Brian Cranston's character, has. As brief as he was on screen, we got attached to him because he was likable, he was personable. The same of Vivian Graham. Again, these are characters who respect the kaiju and understand them in the way we do, while on their own being well done characters. We can understand them, we know what their feelings are on situations, we see them react, the disappointment, the sadness, the joy in some cases. We feel their pain because they are like us. So long as we don't get characters like Ford Brody who is just a doorknob, you can have human characters in a monster movie and not have them feel forced, not have them feel out of place, and not feel like a drag. Even going back to the 1998 American Godzilla movie, at least they gave Nico Tatopoulos a characterization. It could just be nostalgia talking, but I do like that he actually had a personality. He was expressive. Again, he wasn't the emotional range of a doorknob. And it's not even like Aaron Taylor Johnson's bad acting. I personally loved him in Avengers Age of Ultron as Quicksilver. You love to hate to love him. Yes, the humans are not the main characters, but you can still have interesting and compelling characters that are humans. Again, with my own monster stories, the main thing with the human characters is the kaiju come first. Their actions, their feelings, their responses always need to tie into the kaiju in a way that makes sense. The presence of the kaiju must be felt. Things like, why are we meeting this character? Well, they are a specialist on this aspect of counter kaiju operations. Well, this person is an expert in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. This person studies historical archives of monsters and mythology looking for connections between the current monsters and historical mythological beasts. That's why Ford just comes off poorly, because he's more or less the everyman thrown into a world with monsters when most of us are already familiar with these monsters. We don't need an introduction to them. But worse than that, he really doesn't have a connection to the kaiju beyond the Muto killing his father and earlier his mother when he was a child. The worst part is, he simply doesn't have an interest in the kaiju until push comes to shove. He just wants to get back, he just wants to get back to his wife and son, which as an idea could have been interesting, but he was written to be so disinterested in the kaiju, we never got to know him as a character and most importantly, we never got to like him. They could have done something interesting with him, where at first he doesn't care about them, but then, well, they've taken my- they, they killed my father. Now I have a vendetta against them, and now I'm interested in stopping them. To a, a gradual more appreciation of what Godzilla specifically does, a lot like actually what they did in the second movie, King of the Monsters, with the father. But they didn't do that with Fort Brody, and he came off as a doorknob. The most characterization we get out of him is when the little kid in Hawaii is separate from his parents on the train because he was looking at the little army dude figure that Ford Brody has, and then give the little army dude to the kid after helping him get back to his family. And, and that's it. But a person caring about their family is kind of something we should expect from a character. We shouldn't need to see he cares about family. But right from the start, we know Graham, we know Sarazawa, 
have a reverence for Godzilla. Even Admiral Stenz is much better written than Ford Brody. He doesn't agree with Sarazawa and really Monarch as a whole's stance on the kaiju, but he has a respect for Dr. Sarazawa as he is the expert on Godzilla. There's even a compassion that he shows, but it is compassion with professionalism. He is shown to be comforting Sarazawa after they are made to deploy the nuclear weapon which is intended to kill Godzilla. And he is basically a background character. And he is far better handled than the main character of the story nominally. He is not an antagonist, but we understand fundamentally as a military man, an admiral, his job is to keep, well, American citizens, but really the whole world safe from threats. In a world where there are giant monsters who innately pose a danger to humanity, that falls under basically his definition of things that need to be dealt with. Pacific Rim does much the same. Riley Beckett, Mako Mori, Sacker Pentecost, all are well done characters. Even as much of a dick as Chuck Hansen is, he's well done and hateable in the best way. His father, Hercules Hansen, is a good background character and side character who goes through his own development. The scientists in Pacific Rim, again, same thing. They're well handled. They're not, you know, the most defined, as again, there's a lot of characters in the movie, but they're handled in a way that is respectful and that you can identify character traits with them, which just, again, you can't with Ford Brody because he's a doorknob. This is where Pacific Rim Uprising entirely fails. Because Uprising shows it wasn't just the monster fights and spectacle that made the movies work. It was the fights and the characters because Pacific Rim Uprising literally has no characterization. It's just all fights and nonsense and spectacle. Which, those work for some movies, things like Transformers, again, those movies work, but they're just mindless noise. Godzilla and kaiju movies as a whole, they're more than that. Let's move on to things and really the evolution of kaiju. It certainly takes a lot for a character to go from the living incarnation of destruction, a symbol of humanity's folly and the terrible might of our own mistakes, a walking embodiment of nuclear annihilation, into something that can be almost inspirational. But maybe that could just be me. They're not just simply a monster for the sake of being a monster. They are a concept, an idea. And even to say that Godzilla is an embodiment of nuclear annihilation is a bit of an oversimplification. He's more than just a simple harbinger of destruction. He is as much a victim of nuclear destruction as those during the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were. But I think it's time we sort of dial back to the first time at least I experienced these movies. Something that is inextricably intertwined actually with Pokemon of all things. When I was younger, we had, I'm uh, pretty sure it was DirecTV, and the Sci-Fi Channel was one channel right above Cartoon Network, and a few channels below Nickelodeon. And there was a Pokemon marathon going on, and it was specifically the episode of the Pokemon original series anime, where Ash was fighting Blaine and his Magmar on the top of the volcano on Zinnabar Island. And I always remember the exact point of the episode it was at. It was the part where Charizard picked up Magmar and was seismic tossing him into the volcano. And then it cut to commercial break. And because at the time I was probably maybe seven, and my brother was only a few years older than me, we had absolutely non-existent patience. So we clicked up the channels to go from Cartoon Network to Nickelodeon, and that was also on a commercial. So like the little younglings we were that had no patience, we were just scrolling between the channels, waiting for it to go back to the shows we wanted to watch. And as fate happened to be, the sci-fi channel, one channel above Cartoon Network happened to go back from commercials to the program it was on. That being Godzilla 2000. The final battle between Godzilla and Orga. Seeing this giant, fire-breathing dinosaur monster taking on this... Honestly, I really have no clue how to describe Orga. Was something that just it captured my attention immediately. And it, it didn't even matter that Pokemon was still on. I was too engrossed in this to bother to change off of it. I had no idea what was going on, but it was just cool to watch. Little did I know that one moment was going to change the rest of my life. And at that moment, an obsession was born. Something that has persisted even to today, nearly two decades later. But even years ago, when I actually wanted to try to lose weight, it was Godzilla that was the final push to get me to lose that weight. If you go back and you watch videos, streams of me from right when I graduated college, I look very different than the way I do now. 
there is probably going to be a side-by-side -side of my face versus now and how it looked then, and you can just see the difference in how I look. That is what 50 pounds of difference does. And all of that, or the very least most of it, was because of Godzilla. The reason for that being, in Godzilla in 2014, when Gareth Edwards' Godzilla came out, I was adamant I wanted to get a shirt for that movie, see it the first day, and wear that shirt to the theater when I saw it. At this point, I'd actually been a fan of Godzilla for more than half of my life, and I was not going to let this chance slip by me. I wanted to show my support for, well, my favorite character in all of fiction. And I still have that shirt today. So I had that shirt, wore it, but years later, I gained weight, let my health slip, and the shirt didn't fit me anymore. It broke my heart that I couldn't wear that shirt anymore, but as time passed, I, I wasn't gonna just sit idly by, I wasn't gonna just replace that shirt, the one that I saw when I saw, the one that I wore when I saw the first Godzilla movie in over a decade to be released. I wasn't just gonna throw it out and replace it. I dug deep, and I began to lose weight, and eventually I lost 50 pounds and that shirt fit me again. That is a shirt that I got a decade ago, that after about four years no longer fit me, and that within the last two years is now able to be worn by me again. Godzilla is a character that motivates and inspires me in ways even I'm surprised by it today. I wanted to be a part of it. When I was 12, this was actually a bit before Pacific Rim came out, I'd been thinking about making my own kaiju stories. Uh, some pictures of some of the monsters actually might be here somewhere. They're horribly cringy, the initial ones, and I pray to God no one ever sees them. I'm still working on them right now, I scrapped everything and started over, and it was stuff like Guillermo del Toro working 18 hours a day, 7 days a week on Pacific Rim, that kind of passion to make these movies more than just monsters, not just a creature, but a character. Something that inspires me to keep going forward that there is a place for these in the world today. It's why when I see things like Godzilla Kong the New Empire, seeing commercials and trailers, it always spark something in me that nothing else has ever been able to do. A little smile that never in my wildest dreams, even 10 years ago, especially 15 years ago, I could have imagined. Sitting on the floor of a living room every single week, going through the TV catalog for what shows are going to be on, looking for a Godzilla movie, and highlighting them if there were any. I never would have imagined that they would be coming out in theaters as a major series. And seeing how the internet itself also rejoices with these movies, it almost brings a tear to my eye in, in joy, seeing how far these series have come. When I was younger, I was you know, overweight nerd, and being the kid who was, of course, both overweight and would always openly talk about Godzilla and Pokemon and in a time nearly a decade before it was seen as socially acceptable to like those things, you know, being mocked and bullied for that, it, I didn't really care, because I loved those movies. And then seeing movies like 2014's Godzilla, Peter Jackson's King Kong, Kong Skull Island, Pacific Rim, every time I see them, it's... none of that stuff matters. All that matters is kaiju. And then finding channels like Cinemassacre and various other Godzilla creators, it, it felt validating seeing that I wasn't alone. There were others who loved these movies and with the same passion and in some more than what I had. Kaiju as a whole, and really specifically Godzilla, has had a reach and an influence that far exceeds just me, just one series, just maybe even one aspect of media. It has influenced the entire world, fictional and the real world. Being an allegory of nuclear destruction, a way to personify the fear those the victim of that destruction felt, to convey to others in a way words simply can't, shaping real-world thought. But it also affected the fictional world, revolutionizing the monster movie genre, leaving its mark on everything from Pokemon to Star Wars to Marvel Comics and DC to companies naming internal projects after Godzilla monsters internally. A little bit of a personal story about that in a bit. And games with hot anime ship girls, even referencing it. Godzilla has become a part of the identity of the nation that created it. We watch these movies, these series, not just for the fights, not just for the pure spectacle, but because these stories mean something to us. 
in a way nothing else can touch. And I can quite literally talk about these movies for hours, but we would just simply be talking in circles. Who knows, maybe someday I'll go back to my roots, doing a review for Godzilla movies and movies as a whole, as that actually was the first channel I ever did. The current channel I'm doing, Metamaxis, is not my first channel. The first one was a movie review channel where I reviewed the first Godzilla movie about 15 years ago. It was because that channel failed that I feel the drive to make sure this one succeeds. And maybe I will return to my roots someday. Do some movie reviews, do some video essays, maybe even review the animated Godzilla series that followed the 98 movie. Who knows? But I want to thank you guys. Let me know your thoughts below about each of these movies. What was your favorite Godzilla movie? What's your favorite kaiju movie? What do you think and what do you feel about these movies as a whole? What are your hopes for the MonsterVerse? And just what do they mean to you? I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you've said through the whole thing, thank you very much. Please don't forget to leave a like, subscribe for more. And I'd like to thank all my channel members. You guys are the ones that make stuff like this possible. At the Metal Machines tier, we have Miju. It's really Timmy B, Athena Bella, Keith Stroganoff, 8th Agulus of the Grandmaster Ceiling Cat Ouroboros, Sanders Gaming, definitely not Alan, That Guy Jared, Dragon Dance 05, Ash Ketchum 78, and Tag. Our two Steel Commanders, JD Pooh and Mudkip, and our two Kaiju Crushers, Unbound Legends and Michaela Yenma. Thank you guys. These movies, these series, they mean a lot to me, and I know they mean a lot to you guys as well. We've got a lot of plans for some kaiju things in the future, so please don't forget to leave a like, subscribe for more, and let me know your thoughts on these movies and these stories below. I couldn't do it without you.